Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Um, so good afternoon and welcome. Just a heads up uh, that uh, this panel is being recorded, though probably you're safe back there in the audience. It's mostly those of us up here. So welcome to today's conversation on the evils of polygyny. Um, evidence of polygyny, I'm going to trip over that, evidence of its harm to women, men, and society, uh, which is my colleague Rose McDermott's important new book. I'm Professor White Shapiro, and it's great to have you all with us today. So the Taubman Center focuses its research and programming on three themes, the cost of living, the value of democracy and the price of security. And Professor McDermott's new book offers an important perspective on these themes by examining gendered violence. Based on more than a decade's worth of research, Rose's book examines the violent impact of polygamy on women, children, and the nation state. And through her novel approach, she opens new terrain at the intersection of political psychology, international relations, and gender. I'm pleased that we have a good bit of time together this afternoon to unpack the important mechanisms and findings in this book and to celebrate uh, the real uh, accomplishment that this book represents. Um, to go, turn to introductions, Rose McDermott is a world-renowned scholar of international relations, the author of over 200 academic articles and five books. Uh, she's a fellow at the National Academy of Arts and Sciences and one of the principal investigators of the Women's Stats project, which is the most comprehensive compilation of information on the status of women in the world today. So thank you, Rose, for this book and for really everything you do for our intellectual community here at Brown, at the Watson Institute, the Political Science Department, and more broadly. We're honored to have three distinguished panelists to discuss Rose's book this afternoon, and I'll introduce them in alphabetical order. Valerie Hudson is a professor and George H.W. Bush Chair at Texas A&M University's Bush School of Government and Public Service, an expert in international security and foreign policy analysis, as well as gender and security. Her publications include four books and eight edited volumes, including her most recent book, The Hillary Doctrine, Sex and American Foreign Policy. Among her many awards and honors, Foreign Policy Magazine has named her one of the top 100 most influential global thinkers. And she is also one of the principal investigators of the Women's Stats Project. Kristen Renwick Monroe is the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Political Science at UC Irvine, here at the end. She's an expert on political psychology and ethics with a special emphasis on rationality, altruism, genocide, and gender equality. She's the author of 18 single authored books or edited volumes and over 100 articles and book chapters. Among her many awards, she has received two Pulitzer nominations, a National Book Award nomination, several American Political Science Association Best Book Awards or Honorable Mentions, um, and two of the APSA's Lifetime Achievement Awards. Um, finally, Pamela Reeves is a senior fellow here at the Watson Institute. She advises international organizations, foundations, and companies on building public-private partnerships and developing gender strategies to achieve both business and public purpose results. She is a senior advisor for gender strategy to the Executive Office of Melinda Gates, and she is the former director of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's International Fund for Women and Girls at the United States Department of State. She is also a graduate of Brown University and serves as a member of Brown's Board of Trustees. So to just let you know the format for this afternoon, um, Rose will begin with a brief overview of her book, and she has some slides for that. Um, we'll then follow with up to 15 minutes of comments from each of our discussants um, in alphabetical order. And then we'll open to question and answer. Um, I would just ask all of you, given the many of you in the room, to be mindful of our shared time to keep your questions or comments brief to the extent possible to allow as broad a participation as possible. Um, and then after the panel, please join us for a reception and book signing in the lobby here at the Watson Institute. So before we get started, please join me in welcoming Rose along with Valerie, Kristen, and Pamela. Um, I think I need help with the screen, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking um, Susan Moffat, the director of the Taubman Institute, um, so much for uh, sponsoring this book launch. And um, Rebecca, thank you for moderating it. And I'm really grateful to all the panelists for coming and talking about this today. 
And uh, with his impeccable timing, Richard Wrangham, who is walking in the door, who's um, a world-renowned uh, professor of biological anthropology and evolutionary biology at Harvard. And um, I'm really going to begin with a story about him, um, because this whole project really begins with a conversation Richard and I had over a Xerox machine in 2001. So you think books take a long time. This book took me like 17 years. Um, <laughs> and it was after, uh, so most of my books actually come from uh, ideas that come really from other people. And this one really is, is uh, down to uh, Richard's uh, incredible inspiration. And so I'm really, really grateful to you, Richard. I really want to thank you for that and thank you for being here. Um, so um, the original impetus of this project was a conversation that we had where um, we were talking, um, it was right after the 9-11 attacks, and we were talking about all kinds of aspects of American foreign policy and violence around the world. And, and Richard said, you know, I think so much of this really has to do with male control over female reproduction. And I said, what? Um, <laughs> and he said, yeah, it really, it comes down to polygyny. He says, there must be some data on this, right? And I said, wanting to impress him, of course there's data on this, <laughs> which of course there was not. And so that brings us to how I came to meet Val Hudson, um, who really is the spearhead, or a spearhead of the Women's Stats Database Project. And I joined this project basically fundamentally to try and get data on polygyny around the world. Um, and so that's how that part of the project worked. And for the better part of 15 years, we collected a lot of data on polygyny around the world as part of this database project, which um, she, of course, started with, with um, a much larger agenda. I joined it really because of my interest in um, collecting data on polygyny, and then we, we developed a much larger project out of it. Um, and um, one day when I was at the University of California, Santa Barbara, I got a call out of the blue from um, a woman named Joanne Kleinberg, who was the Attorney General of Canada. And she said, we're doing this constitutional uh, reference uh, trial on uh, whether or not to keep polygamy illegal in Canada. And so um, I ended up being the expert witness for that um, Canadian reference trial where they upheld the ban against polygamy, uh, in large part due to um, the work that um, Richard and Val and I had begun, and um, BJ Ray, who is the a person who works for the Attorney General of Canada in Vancouver is one of the commentators in this volume, as is um, Professor Hudson and also uh, Bob Jervis. So um, I just wanted to start with just a few comments, and then I, I want to leave it to the panelists, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Partly how I got involved in this is that most political scientists, when they talk about politics, they really talk about nation states. And I think that there is only one universal political institution around the world across time and space, and it's marriage. Um, and that is a fundamentally political institution and is the only universal one um, grounded around this bedrock of family structure. Um, it has enormous political, social, and economic consequences that have really not been sufficiently explored by political scientists uh, in terms of its impact on many outcomes, but in my particular case of interest, violence and conflict. Um, so there's lots of uh, ways that people get confused around definitions, so I just wanted to make sure we we're all on the same page. Um, polygyny is the kind of thing that gets talked about generally. Uh, you know, you guys all watch Sister Wives or Big Love or any of those kinds of things. They talk about polygamy. Um, but really, there's two different forms of it. A woman who has many husbands, that's very rare. I know there's a political community of polyandrous people in Seattle. It uh, doesn't tend to cause any problems. Um, but uh, it's rare and uh, doesn't tend to lead to much violence. But polygyny is, is quite common um, and is one husband um, with multiple wives. And this book is really just about that case. It's not about uh, the case that has to do with polyandry. Um, this is not people who have sequential relationships. This is when people are simultaneously married um, to more than one person, having children with more than one person at the same time. Um, and one of the consequences of it is that wealthy men get to buy lots of women, and poor men don't get any women at all. And their lack of reproductive future causes all kinds of, um, uh, uh, potentiates all sorts of violence. And so um, that's one of the reasons that this has um, become such an important factor. Um, so as I mentioned, part of the reason I got involved in this, the real reason was, um, you know, Richard's inspiration, but as I got thinking about it also in terms of 
traditional political science literature, um, you know, which normally centers on nation state things and ideology and resource scarcity and economic insecurity and so on. Um, I think it's very important to have, to think about the way that um, Val Hudson's work in Bear Branches and others d demonstrates that the level of violence um, against women and children in society is actually a better predictor of all the things we try to predict as um, political scientists than all our established theories. Um, and it tends to get um, enclaved or ghettoized because this is about women and we all know feminist literature is something different. It doesn't really affect the things that we care about. And so part of this book is saying, look, this actually does affect the things we care about in a much more direct and significant way than all the other theories that we have um, that we seem to put a lot more attention on. Um, some people tend to think that polygamy isn't very common, so I wanted to show this map. The darker green areas are where it's more common. You'll notice that the United States is not absent of polygamy. Um, there are enclaves um, that are in various places. Um, New York, Chicago, um, a community at sort of the border of Arizona and um, Utah, uh, Texas, there's a few places. Uh, the um, places in Canada that they were particularly concerned about were in Vancouver and in Toronto. Um, but the darker green areas are where it's more prevalent, um, where more than 25% of women are in polygamous marriages. And then you'll see there's, there's variety across the globe in other places. This map, like many other maps, is up for free in the Women's Stats database, um, where you can scale various um, variables related to women and children on maps across the world. And anyone can access that um, uh, free on the web. Um, so I want to just mention very quickly a few of the consequences that I discuss in the book and then leave it to the um, commentators to delve into it more directly, but just to note some of the important things that are economic consequences, um, decreasing fertility, uh, increasing savings, and increasing output per capita by really huge margins just by banning polygamy. Um, and importantly, it has a huge impact on longevity. Um, not just for women who are more likely to die in childbirth by having multiple children at young ages, but also the children of those unions. So this has a really direct impact on longevity and um, mortality. Um, there's physical consequences. And in fact, just before we came in here, Val and I were um, talking about um, evidence that just came out actually showing that um, uh, sexual violence and especially sexual trauma in children um, has direct genetic effects, um, not only on the people themselves, but on their children. Um, there's a decreased all-cause mortality of about 20 years from child sexual assault. So if people have been the victims of child sexual assault, they're more likely to die 20 years earlier. On average, of every kind of illness, um, looks like therapy around the time of um, uh, assault mitigates that somewhat, but we're talking about a huge public health crisis as well um, when you think about people um, having child sexual assault and also giving birth to children out of conditions of child sexual assault. Um, you can see on this map, it just shows very, um, uh, you know, kind of an eyeball figure. You can see the rate of marital discord and its relation to fragile states index. So we think a fragile states index is a really great indicator, um, and you'll see how closely it's related to the percentage of women in polygamous unions, uh, not an insignificant relationship. Um, and clearly, as, as Professor Hudson's work has shown, um, these kinds of um, sex ratio imbalances are associated with all kinds of repressive and authoritarian governments, um, inequality in economic uh, distribution, um, and lots of things related to violence and, and conflict. Um, going back to some of the important social consequences, a lot of which, of course, relate to the fact that there's a lot of heartbreak, right? People who end up in very difficult circumstances of abuse, lots of um, men who don't have access to have the ability to have children and so on. Um, but a lot of these consequences really come down to um, Richard's original inspiration about how this is a lot about men's control of both women's productive and reproductive capacity uh, for their own benefit. Um, and women not having the ability to have male kin nearby who can protect them um, from men who might take advantage of them. Um, so very quickly, uh, as I mentioned, this project begins over a Xerox 
um, Derek's machine conversation with Richard uh, develops uh, with Val Hudson and I and two others and eventually many others um, being involved in developing the Women's Stats database. The um, project in Canada was inspired by Joanne uh, Kleinberg but finished with B.J. Ray, who's the commentator. Um, and Kristen was really the one who was um, encouraged me to make this a book. And that happened because I sent versions of articles in this uh, volume to many, many journals, all of which rejected it without any kind of um, substantive criticism. So they couldn't come up with anything wrong with the statistics or the theory or the argument. They just didn't like it. And so I got really frustrated and, and Kristen said, well, why don't you turn it into a book? Um, and so that's what we did um, and made it easier to get it past uh, reviewers and editors um, who may not have liked uh, the, t the topic or the content. Um, and finally, I just want to mention the way that the book is structured. There's a chapter talking about the importance of psychological models for examining political behavior. Um, there's the bulk of the Canadian reference trial work, which is a statistical analysis of the relationship between polygyny and 18 negative consequences for women and children in every country around the world. And as the Attorney General of Canada at the time told me, so what you're telling me is I'd have to come up with 18 separate laws to accomplish the same thing I can do by banning polygyny. And I said, yep. She said, got it. Okay, then this is a very efficient way to uh, go about doing it. So the bulk of that argument is in the uh, is the part on the Canadian reference trial. There's commentary, as I mentioned, from the three people um, uh, noted here. And then the last part of it really goes on to the next stage of this project, which is a cross-cultural examination of attitudes toward gender equality around the world. Um, one of the questions, we have nine domains of questions. One of them is about polygyny, but there's, you know, a bunch of other questions we ask. But um, basically what we do is we manipulate the questions so that half the people are asked, okay, your husband wants to take another wife, he can afford to do this, the first wife objects. And in the other half, the people are told the exact same thing, except said the first wife doesn't object. And then we look at differences based on religion and the sex of the respondent. Um, and we have done this project in a number of different countries, um, but the data here is only from the first six of these. So it's um, Lebanon, Jordan, Uganda, Indonesia, Mongolia, and um, four provinces in India, and that work was actually overseen by Michael Dickerson as part of his dissertation work, um, and he's in back. Um, and those countries are the ones that are included in this, but the larger project, which includes nine other domains of inquiry and many other countries, uh, some of which are asked about polygyny, some of which aren't, um, uh, is another ongoing project. Um, and my final slide is just to say that there's a lot of implications that are important from this work. Um, most importantly, I think it's really a human rights issue and an issue about mitigating injustice and violence and abuse. Um, but also there's really important um, ways in which I think it's useful and helpful to take an evolutionary approach to a lot of these questions in political science because in conforming to sexual selection theory, these arguments about polygyny help us understand why established programs like microloans and like female literacy and female empowerment programs do a little bit of success, but they can't get us all the way there to where we actually want to be if we're going to try to accomplish um, any kind of model of equality um, between men and women uh, over time. Um, and that one of the most important places to begin an investigation of that has to do with these universal um, uh, and very critical um, political institutions which revolve around marriage and uh, childbearing. So with that, I will stop and um, leave it to, um, I guess Val is the first one to make comments. I'm pleased as punch to be here. In fact, I'm wondering where the New York Times is and the Wall Street Journal, and I'm wondering why we're not in Madison Square Garden. Because to be honest with you, this is one of the most important books that you could read. It is going to be a lasting contribution, not only to the social science literature, but also to jurisprudence. Um, this is because of, of Rose's work, uh, the decision of the Canadian court will not only have uh, long-term effects on Canadian law, but also passes into um, the precedent of international law as well.
Uh, so I urge you to buy this book. It really is must read and will be must cite. In fact, I've told Rose that when she does pass away, we're going to have engraved on her headstone, the harm woman, meaning that That's she... That's what I'm called. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the harm person. <laughs> the, the one who was able to put into legal precedent that um, regardless of who practices it or why, polygyny is just plain harmful to men, women, children, and their societies. What's really fun is I won't read the quote, but on page 135 of the book, I hope you'll look it up, um, the, uh, the Attorney General, B.J. Ray, talks about how the, uh, the amicus lawyer was uh, reduced to calling her work abracadabra, statistical mumbo jumbo, um, simply because her argument was so utterly devastating to their side. And in fact, in the decision, her work is discussed by the judge over the course of 10 full pages of commentary. So she made a difference. Uh, I think also important, uh, her work shows us that it's, uh, sex, in addition to gender, is extremely important to look at. Uh, and of course, I'm pleased as punch that the woman's stats polyg polygamy scale was, uh, was important in, uh, in that work. So why look at polygyny? Well, I think polygyny reveals the deep structure of a society as well as its behavioral predispositions. Uh, polygyny is an important mechanism of male control over females. In my own work um, that Rose is uh, privy to, we actually operationalize an 11-point index. It looks at polygyny, but also patrilocal marriage, bride price and dowry, cousin marriage, uh, lack of property rights for women, and equitable family law, all the actual household level means of control of women. Uh, and um, what looking at that does is it reveals foundational choices about power within the society. Because Rose is absolutely right. The only cross-national power institution that's truly universal is that of marriage. And when you un uncover the true foundation of power within marriage, you're uncovering something deep about that whole society. Um, so, for example, you're showing that the two halves of humanity who each are necessary to reproduce will not be sharing power, that resources will not be shared equally between them, that conflict resolution will be coercive in nature, right? You got that built into every single unit of the society that you are constructing. And so, in essence, this forms a first political order which cascades outward, as Rose has shown, into many other dimensions of the society. Uh, uh, I think it's fun to look at some of uh, the work of Patricia Gawadi, who has suggested that uh, when males so utterly control females in other species, uh, when, she, as she puts it, male reproductive interests are allowed to run amok, right, the society suffers. Right. And it suffers in precisely the way that Rose has demonstrated. Men, women, and children all suffer, and thereby the entire society suffers. It's as if a society has literally chosen to curse itself by choosing a first political order of the subordination of women. So in terms of men, uh, men suffer because of, uh, as Rose puts it, the inevitable marriage market obstruction caused by polygyny. The math is brutal. If half of your men are taking two wives, the other half of your men have no wives at all. All right? It is a brutal, brutal logic. Um, some wealthy older men may have many wives, and young poor men will have no reproductive prospects. Um, in Utah, where I spent a, um, a lot of my academic career, um, the math is so brutal that what we found with the, the FLDS communities that practice polygamy is around age 12 or 13, right, these communities will actually kick out over half of their boys, actually drop them off on the highway to be picked up by the government authorities. Uh, we, we actually have a special term for them. They're called the lost boys. And they are kicked out so that those who remain can have the chance to be polygynous. Right, it's just absolutely horrifying. And speaks to Denise Candiotti's famous quote uh, that this subordination of women mutilates and distorts the male psyche. Uh, and it breeds grievance, resentment, and you're breeding grievance and resentment along uh, uh, quite a number of people, 
Uh, Esther Makuwa and others have found that in these types of societies where polygyny is prevalent, uh, it is much easier for terror and rebel groups to recruit young men into their ranks. All they have to do is promise them that they'll get them wives. And, and so they do, as we've seen in Nigeria, as we've seen in South Sudan and other ways. Uh, I love this quote by Barbara Smuts, quote, the degree to which men dominate women and control their sexuality is inextricably intertwined with the degree to which some men dominate others. Amen. That's absolutely right. What's uh, stunning is that we can't see that and that many men can't or won't see that the subordination of women always leads to the subordination of almost all men as well. For example, there's a, a veritable law of social science that you cannot build a democracy on top of polygyny. Okay? It can't be done. Even in the very first democracy, Athens, they had to impose monogamy in order to create democracy. Is this studied in political science classes? No, it is not. It is in my class. <laughs> Good for you. Women, we could go on and on about how polygyny harms women. I think Rose's book is a great synthesis of that. But a lot of it revolves around how low the age of marriage of women gets when you have a polygynous society, where men reach further and further down into the age cohort in, uh, in order to have the, the chance to have a bride. And so all the attendant problems of fertility at a, such a young age and trauma and abuse uh, is, is just, uh, just horrific. And then, of course, the children. Rose compiles overwhelming evidence that children in polygynous unions fare far worse than children born in monogamous unions. Far, nurse, far worse nutrition, far worse educational outcomes. One study showed that children of polygynous unions were 25 times more likely to die than children of monogamous unions. And there's actually some interesting research from early Mormon history that shows the same. Oh, really? Yeah, I'll have to show you that. that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we could look at some of the effects of these kinds of things. Obama, was, or excuse me, Osama bin Laden was one of 54 sons of his father. Yeah, he was the 34th. He's always a middle child. He's a middle child. Middle child yeah. Not only that, uh, he was uh, the son of a wife that was called the slave. Right. She was despised by her co-wives, and so he and he never knew his father's love. Right. Never had a real human connection with his father. I think it was the twenty-third wife. Was that right? Yeah, I think it was this twenty. She. Okay. He was the child of the twenty-third wife. Uh, we found in FLDS communities when we did interviews among them that the fathers didn't know the names of all their children and would laugh about it. Yes, I have so many. I don't even know who they are. Is that boy my son? I don't, I don't even know. You know, it was a joke to them that they had virtually no paternal connection to their children. It was just horrifying. And of course, uh, Rose has talked about the harm to the nation, uh, how uh, polygyny uh, increases fertility, lowers the savings rate, because men are out there buying wives, and uh, decreases output per capita. And Rose didn't mention that she also found greater military expenditures as well in polygynous societies. She also finds lower levels of democracy and civil li liberties, which I think is to be expected. She has a great quote on page 31. Why should we be surprised that children come to believe that might equals right, because that is the relationship they see between their mother and father? Well, that's a very profound question. I think it speaks to that first political order. And, and she also points out in her book that polygynous societies have extremely weak marriage bonds, extremely weak marriage bonds. Uh, and I think that's fascinating because I've been thinking about writing something that talks, or at least argues, that this very weak marital bond leaves men at the mercy of the call of tyranny, ideology, <laughs> fraternal clans, and gangs. That is actually the pair bond that fortifies men to reject these kinds of calls. And of course, it's that pair bond that is the foundation of children's well-being, and children's well-being is the future of the country. All right, policy considerations. Um, Rose is right to suggest efforts have to come from within the culture. However, scholars like Rose can provide the empirical analysis that can support those efforts, and I think that's key. Uh, 
Furthermore, Rose's book, I think, talks about the necessity of demonstrating to men the harm that comes from polygyny. For example, Rose mentioned her survey data looking at attitudes towards polygyny. One of the things that she didn't point out to you, but which I'll point out to you, is in none of those cases, Mongolia, Uganda, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that she looks at, was there majority male approval of polygyny? That's right. All right? It's usually it was 30 percent. Right? About a third. With 70 yeah. percent of men not approving. And why do they not approve? Because they know it's a crapshoot that unless they have wealth, they will be those losers. All right? So polygyny is not popular among men either. And I think this is critically important. We actually recently saw the case of a religious leader in Nigeria, parts of which are heavily polygynous, and, they, and uh, actually adjuring men, don't take additional wives, right? We see the children of polygamous men, all right? Their children are neglected. Their children grow up poor. They're the ones who end up being the thugs and criminals on our streets. Don't marry more than one wife which I thought was a really interesting male understanding of what the consequences could be. Uh, Rose's other point is, I think, very well taken. Women's educational progress and even economic empowerment may not necessarily help the situation, uh, though I endorse both, let me be quick to say. Oh, so do I. <laughs> but let me give you a couple of examples of the tenacity of polygynous structures, okay? If uh, there was one program that tried to educate girls to a higher degree than was normal in order to avoid polygyny. What parents did was they raised the bride price for girls who were highly educated so they could get more money for them. Here's a second one. That's interesting. Uh, there's a company in Utah that decided to do uh, some interesting uh, economic empowerment programs in southern Africa. Uh, and. Uh, what they discovered is that the minute they raised household incomes, right, men took additional wives. Mm. So their economic empowerment programs were actually fueling polygyny, which was so unintended they dropped the program entirely. Scholarly implications, this is my last point. When I step back and look at work like Rose's, I ask myself, is the tragedy of great power politics, which is the title of John Mearsheimer's most famous book, in reality, the tragedy of cross-national male dominance? And you know what I answer? I answer yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but she has a great quote on page 23, which I think speaks to what she said about the, the difficulties she's had in getting this work published. The findings are clear, consistent, and statistically robust across the board. In fact, the results are the kind of thing most social scientists strive for but almost never find in the course of their careers. If these findings were about something not related to women, chances are that they would be treated as revolutionary in international relations theory. Indeed, the effects are much stronger than any supporting the notion of democratic peace that has spawned an entire cottage industry of inquiry. I leave it to the reader to ponder why powerful effects regarding the treatment of women on the health and security of states do not receive such extensive attention. Amen. And so one of the questions I hope we can discuss in the Q&A is what would it take to get IR and security studies to take these issues seriously? Again, congratulations, Rose. This is a, this is a lifetime achievement. Thanks. Can you, oh, it uh, went on. Yeah, yeah, it's on. <laughs> okay. If you can't hear me, just to speak up. I'm going to be a short segue between Val and Pamela because I want to speak both to the importance of the work politically and scholarly, but I want to end up with talking about the importance of it for politics. Um, I first saw the importance in a kind of general way because the two people that we pressed into service to do the copy editing were my daughter Chloe, who had just graduated from Bryn Mawr and one of her good friends. And they were just appalled and shocked um, at what they read. Um, the Kayla came in particular and said, are you kidding me? Is this stuff really going on? And I said, yeah. And I saw it at a more personal level because when Chloe graduated 
from college, one of the people that was there at the weekend was a young woman. We've changed her name in the book. I used her story. But um, she was from Sudan. She was, a, a, no, Somalia, sorry. She's a refugee. Went to Bryn Mawr, graduated. And when everybody else had gone off and doing something the weekend of uh, graduation, she took me aside and said, Auntie, can you give me some help? She said, I'm going to be married off shortly. And she said, can you tell me what sex is going to be like, especially for me, because I've had a female circumcision. This was not a question I anticipated answering <laughs> at uh, my daughter's graduation. And I really was hard put to know exactly what to say to her. Um, I did tell her. Uh, and I was torn because I'm Chloe's mom. I'm not supposed to be giving advice. But she'd come to me and ask advice. And I, she joked. I said, please don't have children right away. Once you have children, everything is going to change for you. She had a brilliant career. She's very smart. She's supposed to support the nine children her father has with her mother, the four or five children her father has with his second wife, and he was considering taking a third third wife, and she was very upset about the fact that she, as the only one in the family who had education, was going to have support all these people. I don't know what's happened to her. Um, this, OK, so that's just a personal level. I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the impetus for the book. This was the David Easton lecture. David Easton, for those of you who don't know him, was a very distinguished political scientist. Um, he really changed the face of political science um, in the 60s, came out with the Estonian theory of system analysis, which was supposed to move political science away from the kind of uh, ethnocentric European-American uh, view, try to make it more objective uh, so it would fit with different societies. So you think about uh, not political parties, but how interests are aggregated, for example. And one of the things I loved about David was that he was a real rascal. He liked to shake things up. He, and so we set up the um, uh, lecture series in his honor. And it was supposed to be for creative, controversial, and cutting edge work. And um, one of the uh, examples of this I saw when I was uh, doing a book on altruism. And I showed it to him. And I wasn't sure if I should just round out the analysis or try to raise a lot of difficult questions that what this analysis suggested for uh, broader work in political science. And he says, oh, yes, you want to cause as much trouble as possible. And I said, no, I don't really, I don't want to. You wanted to. But I just want to kind of do my little analysis. Have people pat me on the head and say, he said, no, 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 no. You have to cause up a lot of trouble. And Rose has done that. <laughs> One of the things I love about her work, and she's the initial um, the initial volume in the uh, David Easton lecture series is that she pushes the boundaries. Um, she, the work is not only creative and cutting edge, it is also controversial. Um, gender, as uh, Rose conceptualized it, as Val conceptualized it, is not something that political scientists want to deal with. They like to talk about gender when it's in electoral context. Women who run for political office in the United States are in the UK, are in another kind of industrial uh, Western society. But they don't want to think about things uh, like polygyny. And um, they, so I think Rose has had to deal with a lot of um, issues that um, most of us wouldn't have to deal with. There's a lot of political correctness that goes on. Uh, one of the things that we uh, encountered when we were um, doing the book is that um, some of the members of the editorial board said, well, you're saying that polygyny happens mostly in certain countries, and those happen to be Muslim. And this is really not something you should say. And we decided we were going to say it anyway, because that was, that was um, the facts. And so I think the last just point I want to uh, conclude with is that we live in a time when truth, in some ways, itself is under attack. You have fake news. You have a president in our country who has a haphazard relationship with truth and facts and data um, at best. And we have, on the left, we have a lot of political correctness. Um, and I think the idea that you might actually do an analysis which is based on data, that these data are things that can be analyzed, they can be reproduced, they can be tested by people, and that you have to have a certain amount of 
integrity to stand by these facts, even why they may not make sense to you, even though they may be findings that you're not particularly happy with, I think this should be a very kind of ho-hum, you know, oh, well, so what else is new? This is what we teach children, students all the time. But it becomes something that's become politically controversial. And I think that we need to um, give full credit to people like Rose and Val who are doing this kind of thing, who are collecting data and are saying these data are very important. They need to be um, collected. They need to be shared, which, by the way, this is not cost anybody anything, which is, again, I think unusual. Most people will charge you a lot for their data. Um, and they're not doing that. They're just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. And because they believe that research should be database, should have a solid empirical uh, foundation, and that policymakers should be uh, allowed to understand and produce these data and make policy which is based on the political reality, not something that you want it to be, but something which actually does exist. And with that, I will turn it over to Pamela. Well. Thank you. Is that? There we go. No? Yes? Okay. There we go. Um, well, thank you for that. And Rose, thank you for the work you've done. Um, you know, I am a, I am a practitioner. Uh, and I am somebody who builds policy and strategy based on data. So this is, you know, the groundwork, the, the real clay of what we need to move forward in my fields. Um, and I'm also somebody who encourages others to collect data and to be both ambitious about data and also skeptical about data, right? Because I think that causes us to dig ever deeper and find right down to the bare bones of, of root causes. Um, and once we can do that, we can really get to the task of solving problems. Um, I am fascinated by Professor McDermott's work because I spend my time thinking about societal norms and systemic barriers and the things that we accept just because it's always been that way. That's the way we do it. Um, and maybe because I went to Brown and maybe not, but I don't think that's okay. Um, so while I am not an expert in polygamy, as my colleagues here are, I do know something about the critical importance of collecting and respecting high quality data to inform policy. So you heard about my background. And I spent the earliest part of my career um, designing and Im implementing US policies and programs on democracy and governance. My first project was in Panama during Noriega's time, for those of you old enough in the room to remember who that was. He was the biggest thing on the foreign policy screen at the time. Um, and it was later that I um, began to delve into women and girls and global women's issues. So I've been able to see firsthand the importance of a strong evidentiary foundation, which is a fancy way of saying good data, um, for building workable and sustainable policies. And there is an entire body of literature devoted to evidence-based policy. So if this is something you're interested in, I um, encourage you to find it or ask me about it. I use it when I teach. Um, so why am I fascinated by this work? Uh, Professor McDermott, um, in the work that is the background to this book, has created an entire ecosystem of change by reading and communicating data. And to me, there is no greater value, no higher value for the use of data than that. So she's managed to create what has sadly uh, a far, is sadly a far too elusive bridge between statistics and practice. Um, and you should not only be congratulated for that, but I hope you will be emulated. Uh, things move much faster, as we all know, and I certainly know in my work uh, in philanthropy, in policy, and within legal frameworks, um, things move much faster when you can prove your point. So Secretary Clinton called the investigation and use of reliable data the backbone of smart policy, and that's in quotes. Others call it 21st century policymaking, but we all agreed across government that the lack of reliable and consistent data prevents us from making sustainable policies, and it is true in philanthropy as well, and in the creation of programs designed to support societal and economic transformation, which are the kinds of programs I've had to create um, around the world. So the lack of reliable and consistent gender-specific data um, as we try to address barriers to gender equality, which was my remit in the State Department and what I spend most of my time doing now, is in itself a barrier to progress on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, right? I mean, think about it. How can we address education policy and design global investments if we don't know how many girls are in school or where, what the quality of their education is, 
if global interventions are working and under what circumstances? Or how could we best encourage uh, increased productivity if we didn't know that just by reducing barriers to female labor force participation, we could increase the GDP in the United States by 9 percent? So we do know that, and we can act on that, and we know it because we have combed the data and we were able to do the math. So that was one of the motivations behind creating the first ever in Secretary Clinton's State Department QDDR, the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. So the QDDR was modeled after the Defense Department's uh, Quadrennial Defense Review, and its goal was to take a comprehensive look at how we spend our resources most effectively, how we can achieve our priorities most efficiently, what we should be doing differently, and how we should prepare ourselves for the world ahead. So we could only do that by methodically and meticulously collecting data and reporting from every nook and cranny in the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development at home and abroad. And to bring it back to the realm of women's issues, we discovered through the QDDR process that we weren't deploying our human capital or our assets, any of our assets, effectively or efficiently enough to achieve our goals of advancing women and equality. So we were able, by looking at what we had gathered and put together, to change our operating systems and requirements in a way that could be monitored, evaluated, and then eventually refined as necessary. So by creating this framework to collect and measure the data, we could define our goals more realistically, we could create more effective policies and programs to support that framework, and then we could measure our progress. Seems pretty logical. Uh, when I was at State, we also launched another project. We did many things. I'm just pointing out two. Um, <laughs> something called Data 2X, um, which uh, has now grown up beautifully under the leadership and careful management of the United Nations Foundation. So Data 2X has become a global cross-sector alliance and a technical and advocacy platform dedicated to improving the quality, availability, and the use of gender data. And they, I think, outline the work clearly. In their mandate, they note their high quality, comparable, and regular. Gender and age disaggregated statistics are critically needed to address existing data gaps and meet the overarching global goal, and when I say global goals, I mean related to the sustainable development goals, to leave no one behind. And they specify that good gender data provides the much needed detail on the disparities that exist between men and women and boys and girls. And that data identifies the underlying causes of inequality and it measures the impact of policy and programmatic interventions. And very nicely, Data to X's tagline is simply, without data equality, there can be no gender equality. So of course, data is never the full answer, right? Data thrives when the textured reality of the facts and figures it represents is presented alongside it. So for example, it is without a doubt important to know that there are some 800 million people living in uh, poverty in the world today, living on less than $2 a day. But it becomes a little more real when you meet a woman who is selling flowers in Bangladesh, like Kapila Ben Vankar, whom I met while I was working at State. Then you understand that every single lily she sold was a matter of life and death, eating or not eating, security or exposure. My point is that knowing the face of data allows us to think not only how can we match budgets with statistics and align policies to support stronger outcomes, the QDDR, but also how can we get Kapilaban the help she needs so that when the road is washed out by the rain, she can find another market to sell her lilies and she can put food on the table. And I think that combination of data and reality makes us work a little harder to get it right. And Professor McDermott has done just that. Um, she's managed to combine statistics with real life problem solving and she's made the data come alive with purpose. She's taken existing data points, she's taken data points that she's found, and in essence she's made them live and by doing that, she's changed policy in a way that will change lives. She dug deep into existing evidence about polygamy, both attitudes and practice. Based on good data available, and when it wasn't available, she found it, she was able to isolate variables and considerations, and from there she could make comparisons and draw conclusions not based on gut feelings, but based on observable facts. Her conclusions are rational and they're verifiable, and wouldn't it be great if all of our policies were built on rational and verifiable work? And with that foundation, Professor McDermott was able to carefully and methodically outline to the Canadian legal system and with this book to the world, the link between polygamy and a host of societal ills. So for those of us who work in the area of women's advancement, and global women's issues, global development, we've witnessed what can be um, devastating effects 
of polygamous and polygamous social sorting. We see, and she's named them all, I'll just note, the strain on a woman's economic potential and capacity, the isolation and silence she's subject to, the sheer lack of value placed on women that these situations represent, and we know it's awful. But Professor McDermott has placed before us the evidence-based common sense of the matter. And if we could replicate her approach, it's so thorough and so careful and so well considered in other domains of inquiry, I think we'd be able to actually solve some of the problems in the world once and for all. It's an excellent model. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you to we Rebecca. Have can yes. I ask? Yeah. Can oh. I invite Richard if he has any thoughts? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> uh, since it was your inspiration that brought it all about. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm getting chills listening to this. I, I, you know, it's just so exciting to uh, to hear such a uh, a positive uh, sense of achievement um, re represented by you in this book. Um, you, you catch it just from listening to you, and then we catch it even more from listening uh, to the panelists. Um, and uh, and it's really extraordinary. So I'm a primatologist. That means I study uh, non-human primates, and then I, I think about the significance of that for understanding humans. To hear somebody say just now, well, the thing about political science is that they're not really interested in gender is so extraordinary to a primatologist. <laughs> because to a primatologist, where you do indeed have politics, it's all about gender. And sometimes the women are on top, and sometimes the males are the females, and sometimes the males are on top. And the dynamics are really interesting. Uh, you know, we can afford to just be interested uh, in non-human primates. But the notion that that you can get anywhere in political science without understanding in depth fundamentally different motivations that have emerged in evolutionary psychology between men and women just seems incredible. Of course, I understand where it's coming from, you know, because in a, in a world in which uh, we are, are looking for uh, justice and equitability, then we don't want to draw attention to potential differences that look like weaknesses from some perspectives. But nevertheless, I'll, I'll come back to that if I may. Please. So, um, uh, it sounds as though, you know, I haven't seen the book, so, you know, shoot me. He but was supposed to be sent a copy, and I, I'm horribly embarrassed, and I wrote this really deep, you know, detailed dedication and left it at my house. So, <laughs> you, it will be mailed to you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a criticism, it's just a justification for, yeah. for not being able to... No, I uh, feel really know, badly that they uh, didn't send you a copy like they should have. To, to say too much at the moment. But, but it's clear that you've got a, a tremendous amount of data together. I, I want to ask three, three questions that seem to me you know, quite hard, which I suspect you've considered all of them, but just want to raise them here. Uh, the first is, um, I mean, they all concern the issue of, of, of what do you do now. And uh, I mean, one is, is just a small and sort of detailed problem, but it, it nevertheless it is, it is important. You know, in, in animal models, uh, there's they, the, when you get polygyny in animals, then uh, it is partly, very often, because females choose it. Right. Uh, and females choose it because uh, the resources that one male controls may be sufficient that even with a second wife added, the second <laughs> wife does better than um, uh, mating with forming a bond with an unmated male. And you can see the same thing playing out in, in humans in all sorts of ways. So, so the, you know, the question is, um, what do you do about the women who want to be polygynously married? And, 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 and that's an issue. You know, you've somehow got to deal with it, because otherwise it, it sets up a, an, a dynamic that is unrealistic. Right? Um, the second question is, uh, about the deeper roots of polygyny, because one could listen to the way that, that uh, the problem has been described this afternoon and think that if only people would just say, look, polygyny has all these incredible negative consequences, so just get real and stop it, that people might just say, yeah, that's a good idea, let's, let's stop it, uh, by some kind of democratic vote. <laughs> um, and the reason I draw attention to this as a, as a problem uh, is that I tend to have a behavioral ecology background where the social systems of the species or cultures of humans that I consider are embedded in some kind of behavioral ecological rationale. 
And you know, Rose knows what I'm going to say here, um, <laughs> which is that, uh, that w we were struck from the beginning when I'm thinking about this, about the association between uh, pastoralism, uh, herding of animals, uh, and polygyny. And uh, cross-culturally, you see you know, quite a strong association here. And there is a logic that can tie pastoralism to polygyny involving the control of women. And it goes to the fact that if you live in a pastoralist society, then your absolutely um, fundamental and vitally important uh, stock of resources with which you're going to bring up a family is very easily stolen. Because if you own camels, then somebody can come in the middle of the night and take your camels, and by the next morning, they could be 50 miles away. And cattle can go a long way too, and, and so can goats. And the, the basic story uh, that emerges out of this is that um, in order to be able to defend yourself against that and, and recover the animals if they are taken and so on, you need to have really, really solid male-male alliances over a large area. And in order to do that, then uh, you want to be able to control your women because the women are available as pawns uh, to exchange in marriage to form alliances. Now, uh, you know, that may or may not be the correct story, but the principle here is that it's not arbitrary as to why certain countries have got polygyny. And if that is the case, then uh, it means that uh, when you, as a Westerner, uh, looking at data about the suffering of women in relationship to polygyny, come in and, and say, time, time to change. Let's get modern about this then what you're doing is threatening people's livelihoods. And, and that means that there are really fundamental problems that you've got to address to think about how you're going to overcome that. That's my second problem. Um, the third is, uh, uh, goes to the heart of, of what, uh, uh, something that Rose said, uh, and, and I think others echoed, um, which is uh, that if, if you see marriage as, as you know, the fundamental institution uh, and marriage relationships as uh, extraordinarily predicative of international um, <coughs> security problems and, uh, and problems of violence within nations, then uh, I think the, the sort of implication was that, uh, that if you can get marriage right, if you can stop men from dominating women within their households, then this will, could have knock-on effects on politics more broadly. <laughs> so I want to challenge that idea by suggesting there is another institution that is equally worldwide. Um, and that is the, um, the use of uh, coalitions by males, oh. ultimately as monopolies on violence. And that I'm sure there are two-way streaks, but you know, the implication of the discussion I was listening to was that I uh, get the marriage relationships right, and then other things will follow. I want to suggest that just as important, maybe even more important, is uh, that male coalitions uh, have uh, an effect on marriage relationships. Uh, and and they, they, are, you know, they are worldwide, I mean, in every country. Uh, you know, it is true that uh, uh, whatever it was, uh, 10 years ago or something, Rwanda became the first country in the world in which the senior legislative body was you know, numerically dominated by women. But Rwanda remains a deeply patriarchal country, as the women MPs themselves uh, uh, point out when they go home and have to do the cooking. Um, but, uh, but with you know, occasional exceptions like that, it's quite clear that, that male coalitions just dominate everything. Um, and to, to push that a little bit further in terms of the um, you know, pretty politically incorrect uh, uh, notion, um, I'll cite Joyce Benenson, uh, uh, with whom uh, I do some work, and, and Rose knows her very well. Uh, and uh, I'm totally persuaded by her reviews and, and others that there is something fundamental about um, men's and women's psychology which means that uh, there are differences in the kinds of coalitions that, that uh, men and women tend to form. And um, males are much more likely to form these rather shallow relationships that go across a rather wide uh, 
uh, number of individuals, whereas women tend to form relatively deep relationships in smaller groups. And uh, there's a sort of bunch of you know, small psychological studies, low level, that, that support that kind of generalization, which of course is you know, certainly nerve wracking to say in a basically feminist uh, <laughs> con context. Um, but, uh, but if that's right, as I think it is, then uh, it, it tends to underlie the really difficult problem, which is the problem of uh, male coalitions uh, and, and their violence. So, you know, I just want to say that I absolutely adore this work, um, but I don't want us to get carried away with optimism that uh, just by starting with the marital relationships, it's going to have knock-on effects. There are, there are deeper issues as well. I mean, I'm sure everyone knows that, but I just want to bring it out. Why don't, Rose, why don't I ask you to respond, and then we can take questions from the audience. Um, okay, so um, uh, thank you, Richard, for those really, really thoughtful comments, and also all the panelists. I really, really appreciate all the comments. Um, I do want to kind of respond to Richard's last three points. The, the first about the polygamy threshold model and the drive of women to have um, polygynous relationships actually is addressed quite a bit in the book. And um, uh, you were actually the first one who point, pointed that out to me. And um, I think that there is some good data that that partly rests on economic inequality. And that once you um, begin to address issues of economic inequality, that shifts. So women will not choose polygynous marriages in situations of um, basically pretty stable um, um, male economic income. It's only when you get really instable economic income that women will choose polygynous relationships because it means they can get richer husbands, right? So it's really a downstream consequence of that. Um, the issue about pastoralism, which I completely agree with, I have to just say, you know, great minds think alike, and the commentary that Bob Jervis makes in the book addresses the pastoralism issue, much to my chagrin because I think that it should be attributed to you. Um, but he actually raises that uh, as an important issue. Um, the third point you raise, you know, all I can say is you're a lot smarter than me, and I agree with that. I agree that male coalitions are um, as fundamental as marriage, and I think that that's the basic tension, you know, is between marriage and these male coalitions. And um, in addition to Joyce, you know, Lita talks a lot about the difference between um, male coalition of psychology and female psychology, which she constructs as fundamentally dyadic, right? So she talks about it as being like, okay, you know, and the way that she, when she originally talked to me about it, she said, it, it's like, why you value Richard more than Richard values you. <laughs> and I'm like, Lita, that's not fair. You don't know that. Um, but anyway, that, you know, her argument was about, you know, Lita, right? right? So, um, you know, that, that there's, there's a way in which those fundamental psychologies, however politically incorrect it may be, it's true. Uh, and I completely um, uh, find Joyce's work persuasive and Lita's arguments persuasive around that. Um, and, you know, I don't know how to think about that fundamental tension because I do think that it, um, that male coalitions precipitate, potentiate, and give permission for and allow greater subordination of women. I think it's how women get subordinated is through these male coalitions. Um, and I would actually love to ask Val's comment on the last point because she's in the process, well, has just written, although I haven't completely finished writing, a book manuscript on this political order um, of female subordination to men that I think is really quite brilliant. And I haven't finished reading it, so I can't speak to all of it. And so I'd like to invite her to have any comments or responses, in particular to Richard's last point. I, I've written that book, and <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to share some parts of it, because I think you're absolutely right. I think that the structure of relations between men and women is in large part predicated upon uh, the deepest insecurity of all, which is the insecurity of men, a singular man in a world of men who are prepared to take his life. And what can he do other than strive to create a fraternal alliance that will have his back? And from that original proposition, you get almost in lockstep every single mechanism that subordinates women. So for example, patrilineality, the need to husband resources within the male line, within the fraternity, within the patriline, 
and to exclude women who will be marrying out exogamously. Right? The, the trend towards cousin marriage to do the same. Issues of transactional amounts, bride price or dowry between men, where marriage is fundamentally an exchange between men. So I would suggest that this is a two-way relationship. That is, the deep male need for fraternal alliance is the catalyzing social mechanism that eventuates in the subordination of women. But I would argue, and which I do in the, in the book, and I'm, if you're interested in reading it, I'd be happy to send it to you, is that you can monkey with the male need for fraternal alliances by destabilizing the subordinating mechanisms concerning women. And we see this happening in Europe, which is the continent that has most moved away from male fraternal alliances as the foundation structure of the society. Right? And so what we get historically, if we look over the millennia or the centuries in Europe, is we get um, a polygyny band, we get a cousin marriage band, we get um, uh, property rights for widows enforced by the church. We get infanticide banned. We get all sorts of things banned that monkey with that straight jacket of the subordination of women that eventuates from the male need for fraternity. And when you start monkeying with it, then <coughs> those male coalitions begin to lose their power. Just as the Scottish, you know, um, what do they call clans. them? Clans, right? Lost their power over time. And all the clans throughout Europe lost their power over time. So that fraternity is, yes, still driving male behavior at the interpersonal level, but driving it at the, the level of the polity, different kettle of fish. So the key, I think, the great key that you can use to undo this is, in fact, the alleviation of the subordination of women by these particular mechanisms, such as, as I think Rose has pointed out. So you're right, but there's hope. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if I could just add one other thing. I do think it also has a lot to do with the relative strength of the marital bond versus the parent-child bond. Mm -hmm. So when a woman's only protection is her son, uh, and she cannot Female feel lion. protected by her husband, because she has a weak marital bond. You get female buy-in into these male patriarchic structures because she needs her son's physical protection to not be murdered by her husband. Um, when you have marital bonds where the marital bond is strong relative to the parent-child bond, the woman can be protected by her husband in a way that she lacks if she's in a patrilocal marriage where all her male kin are elsewhere and her only protection is having a male child. And if she doesn't have a male child, she literally has no life protection. If she can actually count on her husband for protection from other men, you know, as, as you actually demonstrate quite you know, beautifully, I think, in the work on cooking and what cooking means about exchanging food and getting one man to protect you from other men and so on. I think that that, that relative strength of those bonds, parent-child marital structure, really affects the stability with which men need coalitions in order to protect themselves in those situations. So, you know. Can I make a comment? I know yeah, step I'm in. not the one supposed to be asking questions here. You are. Um, but. I Maybe it's not a question, it's just a thought. So this idea about the diminishment of fraternity and male coalitions losing their power is true, right? There are many um, domains in which this is true. I find it fascinating because I do a lot of work in women's political participation today in the 21st century. I don't see a real diminishment of male coalitions and the power that they hold um, and the systemic barriers that keep, which were male systemic barriers that keep women um, out of the process. So it's not really a question, but I think it's something to think about when we're. Yeah, but there's a huge difference between Sweden, right, in which male coalitions are still important and Afghanistan. Right? Absolutely. It's a, it, and so I really think that the nature of the male coalitions, the behavior that the male coalitions are prepared to undertake, the level of the subordination of women is of a completely different character 
than in Afghanistan where the male patrilineal defined clan is your only hope of survival. I wish it were universal. Um, so let me open the floor to questions. I'll ask you to be brief. So, and we have um, some undergraduates who can give you a microphone, which even if we all can hear you is helpful for the recording. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, I had one question, like what causes variation in polygamy? So does like um, increase in GDP lead to more or to men marrying more women? Or is it that development leads to men marrying fewer women? Or is there some kind of correlation or causation that you could point out? And, um, and second also, is there variation in terms of, you know, Polygamy in Saudi Arabia is it different than what's happening in Somalia to what's happening in um, I don't know in Utah or whatever? Is is there some kind of you know variation that you know, in the way that that this institution works within a society and within the political economy of a society? And then third, if this is a story about like development that certain societies that have certain economic or you know, means of production like a Marxist story. Um, do we have to change then, like the con like do we have to change pastoralism? Do we have to get rid of this institution in order to get rid of, you know, polygamy? Or how 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 would that work? Um, so, in response to the first question about um, variation, there's definitely variation around the world. The first thing I should say is that most um, men in polygamous marriages have two wives, but there are men who have many many wives. So in Saudi Arabia. Uh, polygyny, it's not infrequent to have upwards of 150 wives. Um, so that's like, you know, do you remember their names? Forget your children's names, right? Like, do you remember your wives' names? Um, and so there are, there's definitely variance in terms of the intensity of it. Um, it's not as related to development as you might think. Um, so, you know, there's definitely certain degrees of polygyny in relatively wealthy countries, certainly in countries that have passed the demographic transition. Um, so it's not just a simple story about development, like once you have development, you get rid of polygamy. It's not quite that simple. Um, and, you know, there's certainly variance in um, how common it is and how intense it is. As to what leads to those factors, there's all kinds of things that lead to them depending on where it is. So, for example, in some parts of the world um, where there's a diminishment of men because there's been so much um, fighting that there are actually a lot of men who are killed, you know, there there is some polygyny that happens for, you know, ecological demands. Um, but usually it's a wealth-based phenomenon. So as men, as you get greater uh, inequality in economic distribution, you get wealthier men purchasing more wives. So it's really a, a sort of economic inequality, which is not the same as development or poverty, right? It's really about issues of um, instability and in the status of male coalitions. <laughs> work. This is uh, exceptional. And I, I, had really, I really enjoyed the conversation that the panelists have had about um, just telling us more about the, the politics of polygamy and like, why this is a central problem we need to be talking about more. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first is kind of um, uh, when thinking about like why polygamy is uh, so sort of uh, pervasive, why is it able to sustain itself and so difficult to, to, to dismantle. How do you separate um, kind of what's going on in terms of one, you have like, the, you have like sort of the, the sort of a, the individual self-interest story um, where uh, especially wealthy men, it's in their sort of self-interest to preserve this, this institution um, versus sort of the cultural norms story that seems to be lurking as well. But then um, I think what was really fascinating about the Canadian case, which was this sort of like the the legal legitimacy aspect of it, like what happens when, like all of a sudden, like there's like sort of pressure, or at least like legitimacy from or incentives from um, the legal arrangements to engage in this kind of behavior. Um, how do you separate those three sort of narratives and sort of situate them in terms of like which one would be more important versus the other two? And al also, what are some other stories to consider when unpacking this? 
um, the second story is kind of, the second question is about um, the racial undertones. Uh, so it, it, seem, it seems to be that um, there, are the, there are some racial politics sort of kind of laying dormant here. And I, I wanted to kind of hear your, your sort of take on how this interacts with kind of like thinking about global, global race, racial dominance, um, history of um, you know, colonization, because that seems like it's kind of very much a part of the story that I would just want to see fleshed out and hear what you have to say about that. Um, yeah, I mean, with regard to the, the first question, the, um, you know, one of the things I'll say about this project is it was less about the sources and causes of polygamy and more about the consequences of it, you know, especially in terms of um, downstream negative consequences for public health, for weapon spending, for, um, you know, um, uh, children, maternal mortality, things like that. What's interesting about the Canadian case is um, I think it was driven by two different facets. There was a group where um, there was basically a break off of the fundamentalist, the FLDS, the Fundamentalist Latter-day Saints um, community that, that um, Professor Hudson was talking about in Utah as well. And what they were really concerned about there was um, um, really young women having children. So um, what they were looking at was um, women would have a birth certificate, they'd go in and then they'd show up to have a child and their birth certificate would show that they were 12 or 13 years old. And so when that happens, the state can actually prosecute the father for child sexual assault because the mom's like 13, 14, 15 years old. So what they did then is they stopped having kids in the hospital because they didn't want the um, father to be prosecuted for child sexual assault. But then what that means is you have a lot more death of children in childbirth and mothers in childbirth. So that was one set of public health concerns. So I'd say that in both these cases in Canada, it was driven by the cost of public health concerns, but in very different ways. So you know, in a system where you have a nationalized health care like Canada, this is a really big financial cost to think through these public health things. The other were um, largely Muslim communities in Toronto and elsewhere on Eastern Canada, so the Western Canada where I did it in Vancouver was the sort of um, FLDS. Um, it was the more the Mormon, sorry, the, the Muslim community um, on the West. And what they were concerned about there was there were a lot of, a very large number of men who would have a wife and she would get a, you know, a health card that would say her blood type was A. He would then go off to Ghana usually, get a second wife, bring her back, and she would get the same health card as the first wife because he wasn't allowed to have two wives. And so her, she would, they would use the same health card. But her blood type might be B. But they would both have babies. And let's say one of them had a hemorrhage. And they'd look and they'd say, oh, gee, she has type O. They'd give her type O blood and she'd die. And the baby would die. Right? And this was a huge public health cost, right? And so they, it was really driven. Now, that doesn't matter in the United States where there's no government health care, right? I mean, it's not, they're like, they don't care, who cares, right? But in Canada, they're actually, it's a public health cost. And it's also a cost in terms of lives and children and, you know, things like that. So that, you know, that was a really, really central part of the concern of what was going on was actually a, a public health concern. Um, you know, with regard to the race issue, it's hard for me to think about it because well, I'm sure that there's, you know, vestiges of colonialism and so on. Um, I think one of the concerns is that when Westerners go into, let's say, parts of Africa and say, you got to give up polygamy, it looks like a colonialist enterprise of, you know, trying to tell people culturally what they need to do and, you know, you should do this because, you know, we think it's the right thing to do. The problem is, is that Who's suffering is not the white people, right? I mean, who's suffering from these practices of polygamy in terms of sex trafficking, female genital mutilation, child mortality, maternal mortality, low interbirth interval? I mean, you know, I could go on and on and on and on. It's not the white people, right? Um, and so, you know, it's a very, very difficult space to negotiate. And I don't really have an adequate answer for that because there is certainly politics of dominance. Um, but when I think of what dominance is primary, to go to the, you know, the point that Professor Hudson made, the dominance that I see as primary is, is male dominance over female reproductive control and capacity, um, rather than issues of race, which is not to say that they don't matter, 
Um, but um, I think that's where these, you know, you get very strong male coalitions across race too. And so it's, there's cross-cutting cleavages in, in that regard. Over here, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I want to ask you a question about what kind of institutions, I know you focus a lot of your work on the consequences of polygyny, but I wanted to ask more about what kind of institutional changes are needed to uh, precede the end of polygyny in order to take care of you know, these services and other types of socioeconomic benefits that need to be, um, I guess, changed in their distribution and other things um, once polygyny does end. So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about what those institutional shifts look like and how they manifest themselves. I don't know, Jesse. I don't have a good. I don't have a good sense of it because I guess I'm not so optimistic about it ending. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it that way. Val, do you have suggestions? I wasn't sure exactly what you were asking. So, what institutions would be needed if polygyny ended? So, like, let's say that there are women who now need more access to different sorts of services independently of oh. the partner. I see what you're saying. Oh, they actually have instituted things like that in both Britain and France. I'm sorry, I didn't understand oh, the question either. I think I see what he's so, um, what so they de polygam de habitate well, away from polygyny, yeah, assuming that there are different types of services and distributions of services that need to occur. That well, the ones that they've set up in France and in Britain in particular are, um, and it's very interesting because it's in the context of immigration policy, right? So the idea is that if they, um, how a lot of the men keep the women from, do, you know, um, opposing them is saying, okay, you're going to get deported back to wherever it is that you came from. And so basically what both Britain and France have said is if you come to us, the state, and you tell us about your polygamously married husband, we A, give you citizenship, B, kick his ass out of the country, C, provide these series of benefits to take care of your children, give you <laughs> job training, give you um, support for your children, give you housing for two years, give you this kind of income. And so they actually give them a tremendous incentive to turn in their husbands, um, who then are prosecuted for polygamy. But the, you know, it's sort of akin to the shift they did around prostitution, where for a long time the women who engaged in prostitution were prosecuted. And then they said, no, 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 that's not what we want to do. They're the victims. We need to protect them and have them turn on the johns. So those are the kinds of policies. It's been pretty successful, I think, in France. They've gotten 80,000 women to come forward, and in Britain, 100,000 women to come forward. So it's a pretty, they're pretty large numbers. And this is across the course of, say, 15 years. I mean, it's not like, you know, in a given year. But um, that's my memory of it. I have a question for Richard. How much of the uh, <coughs> conclusions that you were raising about polygyny are based on primatology research, and how much on just human research? <clears throat> well, I'm not sure what you're thinking of uh, with my conclusions, but but I, I would say it's based on human. It, it's it, it, the it's the deep principles that come from primates. Just you know, thinking about um, uh, the fact that that uh, males and females tend to have different interests, uh, and uh, that uh, how those play out in terms of dominance uh, depend on the both the evolutionary psychology and the, the local ecology. But you were saying you were talking in particular about the. Uh, thought you were arguing that the need for male coalitions mm. is deeper than the need for polygyny, and is that based on your work in primates or that, just that, humans? That, that's based on humans. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, you know, the really striking thing is that uh, there are different species of primates that show it going different ways. Okay. So you know, we have uh, our two closest relatives, famously, are the chimpanzee and the bonobo. Um, two species that, that uh, have the same degree of difference in body size between males and females mm -hmm. uh, that look so similar to each other that uh, people uh, would mistake them until they've become you know, quite familiar with them. And yet they have entirely different patterns of, uh, of dominance. So in uh, the bonobo, uh, females are um, uh, routinely dominant to males. So the, the most dominant individual in a social community is typically a female. Uh, in uh, chimpanzee, it's entirely uh, males who are dominating the females. Uh, 
So the specific conclusions uh, about humans come from thinking about humans themselves. I was curious if you had a response to Val's <coughs> response to your question. He's going to oh. read the book first. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I'm, I, well, I, but, but I do, you know, the, uh, about the, um, uh, the way in which in Western Europe uh, the, okay. the male coalitions have, have changed. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I, I totally uh, embrace that, that, uh, that notion. Um, but the, you know, the interesting question to me about that is even if it is the church, I think, that you know, banned cousin marriages and, and led to many of these changes, um, the question is why was the church able to do this? And you know, why was the Christian church this break off from the Jewish? And the Jewish were pastoralists much more, and the Christians were becoming much less pastoralists and much, much more involved in trade and, uh, uh, and, and regular kinds of uh, farming agriculture. So you know, I, I would look for those sorts of ecological differences to, to be drivers of the changes that became possible through, through uh, a church which had both positive and negative consequences. And, uh, and, and it makes me think that the long-term consequences, I mean, looking at it from 30,000 feet, <coughs> the long-term possibilities for, for uh, the human, say, uh, loss of polygyny, uh, will be when vegetarianism increases, uh, when we are less, you know, literally less dependent on uh, herd animals. Because as long as people's living in uh, the Middle East is dependent on herd animals, it'll be very difficult for them to accept a good dose of Western liberalism, uh, you know, in, in the teeth of uh, the loss of money and, the, and, and so on. So I'll just mention one of the things that's really interesting about that with the church is that there's this political scientist named Bruce Buena de Mesquita, and he's actually writing a book right now um, about how the, the fight between the church and the empire, you know, the emperors in sort of the Middle Ages led to exactly this kind of division that you're describing. And so he sees it as the, com the competition over tax money that happens between the church and the emperors that leads to the ecological changes you're describing. Huh. Uh, and less meat also is better for climate change, and although I still eat meat. I would suggest that part of it is also how do you create a powerful empire based on men who are not able to marry and have offspring, or at least a legitimate offspring. And that is, was the church, right? And they created their power by, in a sense, disempowering the men around them who were able to marry oh, nice. and have children. Huh. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. I just engaged in child abuse. <laughs> Um, so this has been a really stimulating conversation. Thank you to, first of all, Professor McDermott for writing this, this wonderful, really path-breaking book, and to all of the panelists, and to all of you for being here today. And um, please join me in thanking Rose and the panelists, and join us outside afterwards for a reception.